Don't go away. On this week's episode of Doggy Dilemmas, you're going to meet Brady and learn how to teach your dog to lay down and stay. Denise Mazzola is a certified professional dog trainer with over 20 years experience training dogs and people. If you've got a doggy dilemma, Denise can help. Welcome to another episode of Doggy Dilemmas. I'm Denise Mazzola. Today we're visiting Carolyn and her two dogs, Brady and Jordy. And we've got multiple issues, I think, going on. So Carolyn, kind of bring everybody up to speed and um, we're gonna focus mostly on Brady. So how old is he and what's Brady our, what are his issues? He's is a little over four years and his, um, the biggest issue I'm contending with right now is he gets so ramped up and excited when people come to the house mm -hmm. that he uh, barks and, he, and my biggest concern is he jumps up on okay. people entering into the house. Okay. And every now and then he does a little nippy thing mm -hmm. too when he's jumping um, or he looks for something to nip. Okay. And so... Um, like a redirection? It's... It's not quite a redirection. It seems a little more like part of his all, like, I'm so excited I can't contain myself. Okay. So he's jumping, he's barking, and doing a little, you know. Okay. Pull. And uh, for guests and friends, even people very familiar with dogs, it's, you know, uh, tough when mm -hmm. 75 pounds is coming at you. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about you. Yes, uh -huh. we are. <laughs> okay. And the bark is exceptional right <laughs> it's piercing i mean yes. I, i'm sure it's causing hearing damage <laughs> and all the of us who hears it most yeah <laughs> right right okay. so it is you know the barking uh and then the jumping up you know i have one friend that is deathly afraid of dogs mm -hmm. and last winter brady jumped up and dumped her into a snowbank okay um but even you know anybody who comes up even people who can handle it mm -hmm. um, Okay, so let's go back a little further because I want everybody to know that Brady has some other issues as well. I mean, he sort of has a, I don't know if I would say a low-grade anxiety, but he definitely suffers from anxiety. Yes. And, and these two are antithesis of each other. Because right. Because Jordy is... Zen dog. Yes, zen, well-adjusted, well-socialized, um, and they're not related in any way. You just adopted them together. And just the way that Brady is laying currently is not at relaxed at all right. compared to the way Jordy is laying. And he has been stretched out while we've been here. But um, he's done a lot of yawning. He's done a couple of shake-offs, all which are stress signals and ways to try to for him to try to dissipate that stress. So in some ways that's good because I don't recall previously him doing a lot of shake-offs. Right. He Previously, uh, and also to back up, I adopted Brady when he was two, and Jordy, they think, was one. Uh, so he has a two-year history that is blind to me. I don't know right. what went on. But he, and then worked with you and with him for a year with intensive training and, you know, getting on top of it. And with all those environmental controls, he still had this base level of anxiety that he couldn't control and in that state he didn't even demonstrate any stress signals he wouldn't do shake offs he wouldn't mm -hmm. yawn he wouldn't you know stretch um and it's since seeing an animal behaviorist and getting him on prozac that he has his anxiety has been reduced enough so that he can exhibit some normal dog right right stress and communication yep yeah, that's good. Okay, and so how long has he been on the Prozac? I should know, but I didn't look at my calendar. Uh, August 6th, no. <laughs> <laughs> Day permanently. <laughs> was it August? Uh, yeah, well, actually it was August 31st. Okay, so it's the end of August, uh, so August, the, September. The appointment was the 31st, and I went straight from the doctors <laughs> to the pharmacist. Because Brady was suffering, um, 
And, you know, I had reached the end of my options of training and environmental mm -hmm. controls mm -hmm. and right because you had um, done the training you had done the environmental controls and just so everybody knows brady um when he reached well it wasn't even it wasn't even a level of stress that i could ascertain would cause him to start a fight but he would he was starting to go after jordy right and after when, two years of living more than two years of living harmoniously together and jordy being kind of his cushion mm -hmm. with the world mm -hmm. He turned on Jordy and attacked him. Right. And I had seen, he had done a couple of those things at my house when he was in the care. So, but then what changed was you were, you were transferred from Washington to Boston. So you were commuting back and forth and the dogs were home, but with different caregivers coming in and out. So, he, so Brady's routine completely changed. Right. And there, I realized there were a number of triggers that led to his attacking Jordy. No individual trigger was like, oh, that would definitely cause this. Mm -hmm. But stacked all together, it was like a cumulative effect that led Brady to, you know, this high state of anxiety. Right. That right. he then and no way to dissipate it because no he doesn't shake to... off. He doesn't do all those things, and then. With, and there's the other interesting thing that's worth talking about just briefly is there's Brady gives no warning. There's no growl. There's no lip curl. There's no nothing because I because we've talked. But when they occurred at my house, I was completely shocked right. that he was even attacking another dog because there had been no indications from him whatsoever that this was too much for him. And what we guess is because they're both from the south and labs are often hunting dogs and hunting dogs are often subjected to shock collars that I feel strongly that he was inappropriately trained with a shock collar because what could happen and has happened in his case is all of the normal warning signs that dogs have, which is growling, lip curling, sending out signals that say, I'm not comfortable, go away, or give me more space or whatever, are, are completely missing from him. He, yeah, he doesn't have I, them at all. He just goes for it and then now that you now that we you and I and Brad are aware of the triggers, we can intervene or prevent right right from the beginning. But but there was no opportunity to do that based on the behavior that we saw from him because it was vo it was void. It just wasn't happening. Right. He doesn't speak dog language. <laughs> and right. And whether it was a shot collar or something else, I agree that it was trained out of him for some mm -hmm. reason mm -hmm. they thought that was negative you know that his growling or whatever which is perfectly normal and necessary and you know he doesn't exhibit that now since being on prozac and monitoring his you know triggers and ensuring they're not in there um he has gotten better um, in part, like showing the stress signs so mm -hmm. that I can pick up on, oh, okay, you know, mm -hmm. he, this is too much for me. This is too much for him. Yep. Yep. And there's another yawn. <laughs> but he still goes, you know, straight to, uh, I mean, I had an incident uh, last week when I was um, hiking and he was off leash and another lab came at him full tilt. Mm -hmm. And in a nanosecond, the two of them were at it, and Brady's uh, fur was up from neck all the way to mm -hmm. rear, mm -hmm. uh, which is very concerning. <laughs> mm -hmm. It just means arousal. Some dogs, some dogs will get, um, you know, their hackles up because they're going to bite or they're in a fight, but it's also because of play and arousal and other things. Um, but what was interesting when you told me that originally was he was able to calm himself down afterwards. Yes. He felt much faster. His recovery was better. Yeah. I, I mean, pre-Prozac, and he wouldn't have really been able to recover. Mm -hmm. It would have been me like manually mm -hmm. um, with the leash and everything else. And Holding him back. And this time, tell, you were able to, you got him leashed, and then you were able, he was able to follow some commands. Yeah. The other interesting thing is, in all the encounters Brady's had with other dogs, and he's had many, um, he it hasn't escalated beyond a certain point. Now, granted, I intervene, but he also has incredible bite inhibition. 
Right. You know, I've seen him uh, get into it with um, a little, little dog that came in and tried to grab a treat that mm -hmm. somebody else was giving him. Mm -hmm. And it looked like that dog's head was going to be ripped off by the way Brady was going after him. But the dog didn't have even a puncture wound. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's good. So somewhere along the line, he learned that. Right. Um, and bite inhibition is, is the amount of force that a dog uses or doesn't use. And having good bite inhibition means that the dog is using very little force. Because dogs have the ability to crush bone. I mean, most right. of them. Um, do so. That's that is good, and that's those are all the elements that um, you know. Dr. Posage and I were looking at with you guys in terms of you know what's his, what's what are the possibilities for his success? You know, right. What's the outcome here? And the fact that he has good bite inhibition, that we were able to identify that it was a lot of trigger stacking that started this episodes with Jordy, which had never happened before. Uh, um, um, and then the Prozac, and I think, and, and I had, and I, we had talked about medication way back when, right? <laughs> right? When I, when I first I had met the kids, I was like, yeah, <laughs> right, right. And so then, you know, it, not unusual. We're going to talk a lot about motivation of our dogs, but we also have to be motivated to to take that step to do that thing. And for you guys, it was, you know, it was un. Um, acceptable for him to go after Jordy. So right. that was it. <clears throat> Excuse me, that motiv motivation to take that, that next step and see what happens with him. And I'm really great. It's, I'm really relieved and happy to see that the medication is starting to bring that down. And it's, it's important if anybody is thinking about putting their dog on medication, it's a, it's a process. Right? I mean, it takes time for it to build up in their system. You have to be observant. Um, and a lot of times I work with people, so I see the dog every couple of weeks, and I can make observations that this is better, this is not. You know, we need to go back to Dr. Posage and do an increase, which you have just done is an increase, but we haven't, you haven't started him on that. So right. it'll be another couple of weeks before we see whether, and whether that takes effect. And there's also this, this sort of sweet spot between maybe too much where the dog is lethargic and not eating, and that's, that's not the goal. That's not what we're trying to do either. And then you back off and you find that, that area where they are got their energy, they're eating, um, but the anxiety is just under control so that the dog can be a dog and not this anxiety mess. Right, and um, you were integral in, in getting us to Dr. Posage, and I, I would add that it's the medication, but that normalizes Brady. I then, with your help, had to ramp up the training and the environmental controls to help mm -hmm. him unlearn the behaviors that had grown up around when I'm anxious, I'll just lash out at Jordy mm -hmm. or I'll just, you know. Right, right, yep, good. Okay, so he's a four-year-old dog and he's been jumping for probably all four of those years, but definitely for two when he comes in, when people enter. And the other thing I noticed is when I entered is that burr, 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 burr. like that is just anxiety. I mean, right. it's not like I, I have worked with so many people like, oh, barking doesn't bother me. But Brady has that bark that's like, oh, really? Like, this is old instantly. Right. <laughs> and it just keeps going. It keeps going. And the pitch just sort of stays high. And it's just, it's just like he's walking around like, bah, 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 not, you know, and, <laughs> and his whole body is kind of like, ah. right, right. Or <laughs> barking is a sign of stress. So there is some of that as well. So. All right, so let's talk about changing that behavior. So he has four years of jumping and the barking, and I'm, and I'm thinking that we need to address both. Mm -hmm. So the value of that is up here. For, for whatever reason, it, it gets him something. It does something for Brady, so that's why he keeps doing it. Right. If, he, if, he didn't, if it wasn't somehow reinforcing to him in ways that we won't know, he wouldn't do it. Right. So whatever we want him to do is a value of probably way down here. And mm -hmm. so the job is going to be to switch those. And that's going to take time, right? Because he didn't get up here in a, in a week. Like if he had been just doing a behavior for a week, oh, it'd be a piece of cake to switch it, to change it to something else. Right. Because now Four it's years just, of... Right. And now we have to switch that. So there'll be more management on your part. We'll talk we'll talk about, and I'll remind you, you know, leash them and step on it so we just can no longer practice. Any, any behavior, whether it's aggression, jumping, barking's a little separate, we'll talk about that, um, running away, you know, not coming back when called, the number one thing that has to happen is it has to be stopped first. 
Because if you, you can't have them practicing and continuing to do the behavior while we're trying to teach them a new behavior, that's it's just counterproductive. We'll end up grabbing them and yelling at them or reacting to them, and then it, then you know if I could anthropomorphize from Brady's perspective, it'd be like, oh look, now now Carolyn's running around chasing me and grabbing at my collar, and oh this is a lot more fun than I thought that it was even before, <laughs> right? So. And if everybody that ever walked into your house can walk in and just act like he didn't even exist, you know, the jumping might go away. I don't know about the barking because the barking is not attention barking, it's stress barking. So that's completely, that's, that's different. And the barking, I want him to stop jumping up on people, period. But the barking, uh, I haven't really work to address because in part I like him barking. Stranger comes up to the house mm -hmm. and you know. He'll bark. You can get rid of barking when people come but don't worry I, I, I think even he'll bark. I, I don't know really of any dog that it can be taught so well to not bark when guests come that when it's that intruder because you're if you're home your um, your whole behavior and personality will be a little bit different. You'll be on edge. Um, and I would be, I would be shocked to find out that some dog didn't bark or act naturally protectively for some intruder coming in or even walking around the house. I think he'll still bark for that. But it'd be nice if we could tell him quiet or stop or enough or, and give him something else to do. But mm -hmm. um, in my mind, I think we'll, we'll approach it as addressing the jumping first because I want to see if the barking will go away automatically when he has something else to do. Or if we're going to end up with a dog and a downstay who's still barking his head off that mm -hmm. way, then we can do something else. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do something else about that. So just to understand that attention barking, when, like if Jordy were sitting here barking at us for attention, right, that would be, we would treat that one way. I mean, you could get up and walk away. You can ignore him. When he's quiet, we could start to reinforce him for that. But the stress barking that he does, one, it is acknowledgeable. I'm going to acknowledge how hard it is to ignore that mm -hmm. constant pitch. Um, and it's coming from a different place. So it's not like you could walk away. We could hear him. Like after I came initially and then I went back outside, we, he was still bah, 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 doing that bark um, just because he knew that we were here. And that's harder. Just ignoring it doesn't make it go away. Right. As you've probably right. <laughs> right. found out. All right. So but while we're talking about barking, uh, what have you done, if anything, to try to stop the barking and to try to stop the jumping? So uh, when I've hosted, um, I host teas, and when I have about eight to ten uh, friends coming over, uh, many of whom are dog lovers or owners, mm -hmm. I will uh, get my treat bag and I will be in the dining room, not in the entryway. Mm -hmm. And I've let my friends know that they can come to the door, they can ring the doorbell, they can knock, but they should then just come in. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I have Jordy and Brady sitting and I'm pounding them with treats. They're mm -hmm. sitting, they're being quiet, they're not barking, they're not jumping, and they're not running to the guests or to the door. Mm -hmm. And that's, one thing I've done. Okay, okay. And um, are they leashed? Do they are do, are they able to stay focused? Or you find like they leave you and check them out and come back? Are they going back and forth? Or are they just cool hanging out with you? If they're they want to check out the you know people mm -hmm. coming in, but if I'm steady enough with the treats, I've been I've managed to keep them there and keep them focused on me. Mm -hmm. uh, they might turn around and look. But if I'm pounding them enough with the treats, then I can keep them there. I have not had them leashed. Okay. Um, I did do that once where I leashed them. And okay. And no, um, it seems like one of the fights was about treat delivery, and you haven't had that problem recently. Right. And I haven't had, I really haven't had um, issues between them other than that one isolated incidence okay. around food or treats. Okay. So our focus is going to be on Brady and not on Jordy. So he can do, he can either be crated or he's just going to, we're just going to kind of ignore him. But it's, you're, you're going to have to train one dog at a time. Okay. And our focus should be on Brady. Okay. And because Jordy jumped, like he didn't even bark. He barked the second time I came in and it was, 
a little squeal that was kind right, of Right, he does this <laughs> Right, <laughs> there wasn't really anything that needs to be addressed. And as you said, when he jumps, he he's levitating, but it's out here. Like he's just Usually. jumping for joy and he's not jumping on people, which is a difference. So, right. Um, but you, I, you can't train two dogs at the same time. Yep. It's, just, it's just not as effective. Well, there might be mistake number one because I'm with these both of them the same right. time all the time. Right. But he can, you know, Jordy could be outside or he could be crated with treats and be very happy about that while you do a 10-minute session with um, Brady. And the sessions need to start before you ever have people come over so that he can learn the behavior first. So let me just talk a little bit about that, how we're going to do this. Um, we're going to do one dog, and I've, um, over the summer, did a lot of uh, seminars with Bob Bailey, and Bob Bailey is one student away from B.F. Skinner, so his knowledge on learning theory and how to apply it is like nothing I've ever heard before. And one of the things that he reminded us all of is, one, nobody argues that two plus two equals four. Like, it's science, right? It's math. We all get that. And learning theory is really just as scientific and it's been diluted and washed down, and I don't, you know, I don't know why. Everybody that's written a book has seemed to change something, as if, as if you could change two plus two equals four to say, oh, you know, in this case it equals five, and and we've all drank the Kool Aid and thought, oh yeah, that's you know, that's how it is. So one dog at a time. He needs to. We're going to decide what his alternative behavior is going to be. So it's called a DRI, a differential reinforcement of an incompatible behavior. It sounds really, whoa! Ask him to sit, ask him to lie down. That's an incompatible behavior to jumping. So it doesn't have to be, you know, spin 16 times and roll over and play dead for 10 minutes. Right. It doesn't need to be that complicated. <laughs> it's just, because I know you're interested in training, I'm telling you a little bit more than, than others. So it's a DRI, that's what we're gonna do. And it's going to have to be heavily reinforced, like you've talked about with the sit. Um, so it could be a sit, it could be a down. And in the acquisition stage, which is when we're teaching him to do it, the down or the sit, there should be no pressure, no distractions on the dog whatsoever until he has that behavior rock solid. And I would say a 15-minute down so that People are coming over, and then we'll have to talk about what well, the signals will be to lie down. Mm -hmm. And you can have more than one cue mean the same behavior. So you could have doorbell equal sit or down. You could have um, knocking equal sit or down. If you, do you normally say something, oh, come in, or do you just go to the door and, and let them in? Or do you say, hello? Any of those things that start trigger yeah. ah, jumping and craziness. All those things can equal down to him, as well as you saying down. But it would right. be nice if he starts to hear people coming, and instead of going into this frantic mode that he does, he's like, oh, go lie down. Mm -hmm. Because that's where I'm going to get paid. That's where all the wonderful things in life are going to happen to me when I lay down. And he can, he can lie down in a spot. Um, I don't feel particularly strongly that he needs to lie down on a target. You know, it just adds one more piece of training. It's just lie down where you are or right. walk to the door and lie right. down and be there. So when you're teaching him, and we're going to do that today, there's, we've got pressure because I'm here <laughs> right. and they're here. And so it's not, it's not your normal quiet day. But after today, you're going to just practice, practice, practice having him lie down and stay for longer and longer increments until he's solid for 15 minutes with you and you can start adding little distractions like and I'll we'll stand up, squat down, turn around, take your eyes off him, not pay attention to him. He's like, oh, I get it, I get it. As long as I stay here, I get paid, I get paid, I get paid. Then you'll start to add little bits of pressure. And one of the, um, you know, pressure could be um, you taking a step away, because we haven't talked about distance. So when you're teaching a stay behavior, which is what we're talking about, first you want the duration. You want the length of time to be where you want it to be. And 15 minutes just seems to me, we can certainly, you can certainly change that, seems to be a good place for people to come in and for that initial energy of people coming in, there isn't a household out there, there isn't anybody out there watching that says, oh yeah, my dog doesn't do anything when people come in. 
right? right? I mean, Thor's 13, so if he hasn't heard me come in, he doesn't do anything. <laughs> He'll still <laughs> stay on the couch. But if, I, if he feels the vibration of me walking across the floor, you know, he'll get up. But unless your dog is elderly like that, every dog in the household in America deals with this craziness that happens when either you come home or people come in. So you're not, at least you're in good company <laughs> doing that. And on that note, neither dog jumps on us, mm -hmm. me or Brad, when we get good. home. But I also have to admit that uh, the routine is, you know, come in the door and then I... I get down to their mm -hmm. level. Right. That's all right. So they're just learning that you'll, you'll go down to their level and they can greet you and lick your face and do whatever it is that happens and they don't have to jump up to do that. Right. Right. Um, jumping and, I think that jumping and barking are two of the, well, counter surfing is up there too, but jumping and barking are two very difficult behaviors to get rid of because, um, it's particularly with jumping, it's to, in some regards, we're at the mercy of our family and friends who are coming over. Right. And I've, I have said for years, you cannot control your family and friends. So you need to control the dog and work with the dog. And, and, and that's it. <laughs> that's truth right there. You cannot right. control your family and no. friends. No. <laughs> and I, you know, the, I won't get sidetracked, but there's lots of stories. I'm a professional dog trainer, yet when people come into my house, their behavior with my dogs, I just want to say, really? Like, why are you feeding my dogs from the table? <laughs> you know, so I just learned I, I cannot control my family and friends either. So I put my dogs away for certain things because I don't want them to learn that kind of stuff. Right. So the same thing with jumping. You can't control them. You can certainly set up times, you know, can you come at 1, one fifteen, and you can have people prayed through once he's at that point. But the biggest mistake we make is we think the dog understands the behavior, and then we add so much pressure that the behavior falls apart. Um, and and he has to have it rock solid. And then when you add pressure, for example, um, in this seminar, what they did is they brought in a balloon and it had a face on it because Bob felt that there's that waving aspect of balloons and then faces on them can upset some dogs. And sure enough, the dog was like, what is that? And we were asking to target something and the dog was like, oh, I think I, you know, there was this, all this hesitation, the behavior completely fell apart. And, it, and until that behavior was built up again, 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 that balloon just stayed right where it was. And then once the dog, yep, I got it, I got it, then they moved it or they um, let it go higher, right, because it was a healing field balloon, right? So something very simple like that. And the dog's like, oh, I can get this now. Doom, 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 target, 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 target. Yep. Then they brought in two balloons and the dog was like, what? You know, and then we had a smaller breakdown of the behavior. He still targeted, but it was slower. He was more focused on the balloons until he adjusted again. And then by the time we got to the fourth or fifth balloon, the dog's like, yeah, I got this. Boom, boom, boom. And, the, and it didn't even phase him. So then you can add a, a different type of pressure at that point. But we're not going to go from downstay 15 minutes here or here or some other part of your house and then have people knocking and parading in because the behavior will fall apart. And that's right. also not the time to teach. That's the time to prevent and manage. So it could be, oh, look, someone's coming. Run to your crate and get a big old bone. Or go upstairs and get a bone. Or just put them on a leash and step on it. But that, that's not the time to teach. And um, I want you to stay in the teaching mode for, for I don't know, six months the rest to of a year. <laughs> <laughs> Before you go into testing. Mm -hmm. Because if you go, like, when we teach classes where there's always people in class that that we're identified, oh, they're a tester. So we'll say, listen, you need to be a teacher, not a tester. That animal is still learning. Oh, yeah, I'm much more of a tester. I want to see if he can do it. Well, no. I mean, every once in a while, you'll have to ask the question, can Brady lie down and stay when, when I drop a ball? You know, is his down stay that solid enough that when you drop a ball, he can stay? So it's, there will be times where you have to ask the question, can the animal do this? And then you do it. And the, and the and the answer will be, nope, he got up. Okay, so the ball is too much of a distraction. We need to go back to teaching again. And then the ball will be present, or you'll drop it from two inches off the floor instead of like, you know, banging against the floor, just, just as a for example of how mm -hmm. you can manipulate that pressure and or distractions on him until he's solid with doing that. Mm -hmm. And there's also a piece of oftentimes the first time the animal goes through this type of learning, that it's painfully slow, <laughs> so be prepared. <laughs> you can do other things too, but, but it can be painfully slow until the dog sort of gets all the concepts. 
and then, um, then the next time you teach something, the dog's like, oh, I understand this process, right? They're, they're more like the college graduate instead of the middle school or elementary school, okay? Now, just a word about reinforcement, which we've talked about, but um, larger behavior units require larger reinforcements. And it, and it can be more food, it can be better food, but it could also be um, other things. So the example I'm going to give you is, again, Bob Bailey, who has taught hawks and pigeons and crows and all just uh, all sorts of incredible numbers of animals, has also done a lot of work with dolphins. And I believe it was World War II. They worked with male dolphins, and they taught them you know, slowly over time. They would swim out miles. I don't even know how many miles, but miles out to enemy ships plug the intake or outtake valve or something so the engines would, would stop working, and then they'd swim back. That's a huge behavior unit. So what he said is when the dolphin was learning to jump through a hoop, they got a fish, right? Smaller behavior unit, <clears throat> still a good reinforcement, but smaller. But when the dolphin did this swimming out, say, 10 miles, plugging the intake valve of the ship and then coming back, they got buckets of fish and a lady dolphin which we all thought was very funny, but, <laughs> all right. but that's not something that they had access to, right? I mean, right. and in our mind, we're like, why didn't you just swim away? Right. He's out in the open water. You know, I, I can't speak to that. I don't know why he didn't swim away. I guess because the reinforcement was so strong that this was the behavior unit and he would come back. So as you're teaching the stay, when the, when the behavioral unit gets bigger, people tend to think the dog should do it knows to do it or you expect them to do it and and generally speaking I find that most human beings that are training are stingy they'll just give a little piece because he should do it <laughs> because I told him to do it but mm -hmm. but you're really talking about an animal who works and very much what's they want they're going to do what's in their best interest and if it's in Brady's best interest to lay down because you're going to give them I don't know bagels liverwurst whatever we've determined is great for him yeah he'll stay there but if it's not in his best interest, or there's not enough history to tell him it's in his best interest, meh. and he wants to do as little as possible to get it, any animal does, wants to do as little as they have, they want to expend, let me say it this way, they want to expend the least amount of energy for their bigger bang, for their effort, for their flight. Birds, it's, science shows that birds will fly further for a higher protein meal. Otherwise, they're not going to expend that energy. Right. Because it's all about survival. If they fly five miles and they find nothing, <laughs> right. You know, their, their, chances of life, <laughs> right? their chances of life expectancy just kind of decreased a lot. All right, so let's get, I think Brady's warming himself by the fire. Yeah, he, he's a... Uh... <laughs> Which is typical. Jordy likes the cool, so yep. he's in here, and Brady wants the heat, so he's in there. Brady! I'm going to get everybody. Uh, I'm going to get my bag of tricks. And there's no issues, so let's... <clears throat> do something with Jordy. I don't know where you want him to go, but I'll put him up in the bedroom. Okay, so he can go up there now. Okay, you're gonna stay I'll here get with me. Some tweets for you. Come on, Jordy. Okay. All right. So let's just see his. What? So you tell me. Do you want a sit stay? I or think down, down is better. Okay. Uh, sit. He's too positioned to. Right, and I think it's gonna be easier it. for him to lay down and stay for a period of time. And he's been offering them to me. Um, Good. Like this? Although even, he's been offering even a relaxed down, not the. Okay. So I want you to just take a few treats and you know, I want you to do three downs. So you can toss a treat to help him get up. I want you to do one sitting, one standing, and maybe put your foot on the chair or something. Just three different positions so that we're sure that the down is generalized, that it's not dependent on context of, oh, She's holding food in my hand, I'm gonna lie down, right. right? Food in your hand, he's gonna lie down. Or the context, oh, I'm reaching for the cookie jar, the dog will, lie, will sit or lay down. I wanna mm -hmm. make sure that he's gonna do it because he understands either the word or the hand signal or both. Okay, so tell me again what I'm gonna do. So just, you're gonna put the treats behind your back mm -hmm. and just stand up and ask him to lie down once or move around so he'll get up, yep. Lay down. Good. All the and way. Good boy. Good boy. So one for that, good. And ask him again. Lie down. All the way. Good boy. Good. 
So do you feel like you always have to... Uh, Usually I have to get him to all the way. Okay. So let's just sit in that chair and ask him. Lay down. Now just wait there. So he's good so give boy, him three for that. Good boy, good boy, good boy. Right, so three because he relaxed on his own. Right. One when you have to relax him. <laughs> That's all right. All right, so down's I've not too bad. I've been using the clicker too. Yep. That's all right. So we don't really need the the clicker for the stay position. And you've you've been Boy. working on this more than other things. I'm out of treats. That's right. So you've been working on this more than other things. This the down. Yes. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. I mean he's been offering he's offering it, so yes. so let me see how you've started the de the stay. <laughs> So however you've started it, I just want to see how you how ask him to lie down, tell him to stay, however it's happening, so I can just change it from, as needed. Hold up. So it's hold up your stay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and crawl. <laughs> so, but hold up also is don't get out of the car until I tell you. Right. And you use it at the door before he goes out the right. door. So hold up to me. Let's let's have some other word because okay. hold up has a could potentially have a meaning for him. Wait and then go. Right, it prob it does. And, you're right. So let though I think hold up is great for those other situations, but let's make this you can use the traditional stay. It can be whatever you want it to be. Whatever you're gonna remember to say to him to tell him that he can never ever get up once you've told him that. So do you want it to be stay? Yeah, I guess stay. Okay. So just stand up again and reposition him. Ask him to lie down. Lay down. Now wait. Okay. So tell him stay. Stay. Oop. Okay, so we can have one for that. Stay. And if you, do you have a length of time that he stays? Do you have any sort of data on where he's at with the stay? Give him another one. Day. So 10 seconds. Um, with the holdups, he's pretty good. Okay. To, he stays until I release him. But he... And do you have a hand signal that goes with that? Do you say hold up? Yeah, hold okay. up. Okay. Okay, so I would say stay, maybe. Stay. All right, so we can have another one that's at 40 seconds. So we did one at 10 and one at 40. Um, his stays are shorter in the kitchen, and, but I realize I've, I'm adding pressure because I'm moving around and I'm... Okay. Okay. You mean his success is shorter in the kitchen? His success is shorter okay. in the kitchen. Okay. So we did one at 40 seconds. We're at 25 seconds. Should I be repeating stay? No, you don't have to. So this time give him maybe two pieces because that was 30 seconds of duration. The total time is a minute 17 right now, but I've, I've been asking you in, within that time frame, we're stretching it out. So the first treat was at 10 seconds. The next one was at 40 seconds, which meant there was 30 seconds of duration. And then we did another 30 seconds of duration. And I would give him- And he broke the relaxed day, but then he Put yeah, he's back swinging in. his hips back and forth, figuring that that's going to do anything. So I'd give him two more pieces. That was at 145, so that's more than 30 seconds. Good. So we're going to go in a total of two minutes at, the, at this point. So at 215, I'll have you give him three treats, and we're just going to ignore this and see. Oh. So that was at 2.09. So any Hand movement. In the treat bag. <laughs> right. So he's just not ready for that. <laughs> right. So I was out of. Yep. So if you're out, then release him. Okay. Instead of risking that okay. happening. The more, you know, it was just one. It was, so it was, it was successful up until two minutes. Um, he had swung his hips back and forth, but he hadn't gotten up. But he's clearly not relaxed. No. <laughs> I mean, he's in the relaxed position, but he's 
that food motivation in him is really strong, which is great. He'll he'll continue to work to figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just so we can tell him to stay again. Stay. And we'll go for, this is exactly, oh, so too much. So go ahead, ask him to lie down again. Ready, lie down. All the way. Now tell him to stay. All the way, buddy. Stay. Oh, so we're just gonna. So this is impulse control, and his just not happening fast enough. So let's just have you move to that chair so he'll get off your, ask him to lie down. Lie down. And do you normally do them All sitting the or standing? Good, he's relaxed. Yeah, I normally, I'm normally standing. Uh, but I have done it. Ask him to lie down again. Lie down. I have done it, you know, I'm sitting in the driver's seat of the car, and mm -hmm. he's in the back of the car, and mm -hmm. I've done a... Okay. One, two, Do I three, reward? four. <laughs> One, two. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Give him one. One, two, three, four. Give him another one. One, two, three, four. Four, five, six, give him one. So we're gonna go back to baby steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and give him one. So I'm watching his hips to make sure he doesn't swing around. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, and give him one. One, do you have more treats? I have. Two. One, two, three, four, five, six, and you can have one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and you can have two. That was ten seconds. That's all. Okay, and then just give me a release word. Okay. Good. All right, so we're gonna have to go back to the baby steps. The first one seemed to be an anomaly, <laughs> In, or or once he gets warmed up, which which to you looked more typical? The first one where he stayed. Both and were typical because he's kind of like, oh, we're doing this thing, and then he gets like, <sighs> okay. So he he he's actually more compliant the first go around, and then then he knows it's coming. Then it gets ramped up and okay. So we're gonna do it again, and you are literally, you know, you need to. Um, count and write it down and I didn't bring in my pad of paper when I'm teaching a dog to stay I literally write down like the like if I have my stopwatch on then I know the duration so it was a total of two minutes and I reinforced at 10 seconds 30 seconds 50 seconds I write that down so that I know exactly where I'm at where the animal is at in training so the next time I can set them up for success yeah because we want Success. We don't want him to he have to be, success too. <laughs> yeah, to be guessing all this. Um, and I will get a uh, pen and paper. The other question I had is, what about reinforcing him when he's down by saying "good boy"? I, uh, I think that's nice and it makes us feel good, but it's not. He's not going to work for that. You can keep it calm. It's really going to be about when this goes in his mouth, okay. because again, that's that evolution. Animals have been. Um, figuring out what gets them food their, their right. entire lives, he's right? He's trying, he's yes. cycling through yes. whatever. He's like, yes, I'm he down is. now. All right, so when you give him more than one treat, come here, buddy. I'm trying to get up. Down. Stay. So let's say he's just stayed there for 30 seconds and he hasn't barked. I'm not going to worry so much about the, the hip thing uh -huh. as long as he's not standing up and as long as he's not barking. So if, when you deliver... And as long as he's not up and... If, if, if I don't want him switching. switching. Right. Yes. So when you give him more than one, I want you to give him one, two, three. Instead of a handful of three. Right. I want you to d deliver them right. specifically like that. Okay. 
Good boy. Well, there's a free one. <laughs> Which works against us. I've if we, been working if we on the leave too it, too. I've actually been successful in getting him to leave a piece of food that I dropped. Oh, good. All right, so let's do that one more time. And you're going to ask him just to lay down. Lay down. One, two. So nothing, so wait. Now recount. One. One, two. Three, four. No, we're just still wait till the barking stops. So if he's barking, he's not gonna get anything. And, and you'll have to decide. Does he do this when we're not here? This barking thing. If he gets ramped up, you know, like we're doing this game thing, right. he will. So on your not, second, not or third? usually, not okay. usually though. All right, if he does, if he gets that pushy barking, that's a little bit more for attention than it is about the stress. So your choices are you can just sit back and relax or you can just walk out of the room, even if he continues to follow. But what he, what he needs to learn instantaneously is barking when there's treats around makes it all end. Yeah. It's going to end. You're not going to, I don't want you to sit there and wait him out because then it's like bark, 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 quiet, 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 treat, treat, treat. Right. And then we, we never really get rid of the barking. Right. And, and that's, you know, that, that just needs to so go So when he barks, that training session is over. Yeah. I How would. much of a time lapse before I could work with him again? I would wait um, maybe 30 seconds, as long as he's not barking. You know, if, even if he's following you around, but you get up, you walk back into the kitchen, you do whatever you need to do, and then, okay, he's quiet, ask him again. If he starts to bark, you know, put it back Gigs in the refrigerator. Or, right, mm -hmm. somewhere where he's not going to counter surf and get it. We don't want to set that up. Right. And I know he does it every once in a while. It's not a big thing of his. All right. So let's just, and, and it feels initially, <laughs> you are literally increasing his duration by seconds. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the way it has to happen mm -hmm. until the concept, in, again, the concept is he understands. Now, Let's just for a minute talk about the criteria that we're looking for. So the criteria that will get him a treat is that you've asked him to down, you've told him to stay, and he's relaxed. Okay? Um, and not and do I need, does it matter if I have to ask him to get into the relaxed? I think I you should stop asking him to okay. relax. I think he's waiting for it. Okay. He, because he shifts his hips enough to sort of tell me that he's like, is it this? Is it this? Is it that? No, is it this? Is it that? <laughs> you yeah. know, like what's gonna get like me the treat? Right, like sometimes dogs will paw and speak and roll over, like they'll put all those things together. Was it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? That's what he's sort of looking for. So let's just do it one more time. Let's just ask. So you can stand over here this time. Just ask him to lie down. Tell him to stay. Lie down. Yes. Stay. So we can have one for that because he's in the perfect position all by himself. Yep. One. One. Two. Three. Four, five, and I'd give him one. Oh, nope. Let's just wait. One, two, three, four. All right, so one, two, three, four. Treat him. Just one. One, two, three, four, and treat him. One, two, three, four, five, and treat him. One, two, three, four, five, and treat him. One, two, three, and treat him. Any left? Um, one, one, two, three, and treat him. Then the top one. Okay. Good. And I think that was really good. That was really good. We had no barking. We didn't have the constant shifting of the hips, but, <laughs> but so that was beautiful. And it was short, and it was sweet, and it was successful, and he had no frustration. Yeah. That's exactly what I want to see him doing. And, and sometimes if you're counting up, so I think the highest I got was five. Right. And then he, he started to puff a little bit, right, so we could tell the whatever, the anxiety, the lack of impulse control is coming in a little bit, then drop down to three. So mm -hmm. it's not like you're going to go five, seven, ten, twenty. If you get up to eight, go down to four. I try to split it in half. I get up to 10, I go down to five. Until I really see that the dog is understanding, oh, the longer I wait, the more will come. So all of this was just one treat delivery.
Now, the reason I said stop, because he was, he was relaxed, and then he, um, I can't remember what he did. He either did Finks or he, yes, he did Finks. Like he, he went from relaxed hips to this hip just as you were going to deliver a treat. And I said, stop, because you don't want to relive all of those mistakes, which are um, that you treat him for being too rigid. So let's do one more. And, and, and this is going to be a very uneventful training day because that's what it needs to be for him to be successful. And as, as he starts to get those messages of staying in the relaxed position is what makes the food come to me, he'll do it more. So if he's switched his hips, you have to recount so that that almost gets erased. Oh, okay. Um, but it would be better to try to get the treat delivery happening before he starts to play with that mm -hmm, hip position. Mm -hmm. And don't put a treat in his mouth because it was almost so close. He looked cute. Stick to the criteria, and then you'll get more of it. But every time you put a treat in his mouth for anything else, you've basically told him, offer that to me again. Right. And we don't want all that. We want it, and he'll get it when we're clean about criteria and what we're reinforcing, the behavior will be so fast, you'll be shocked. It'll, it'll seem so easy. <laughs> but it's when we reinforce for all these almost, it was cute, oh, that's okay, that the animal's like, oh, okay, so this position, this position, and this position are all equal. I get treats for all of them. I'll offer any one of them. And then we get frustrated and, and start to use things like, oh, he's resentful or stubborn or some of the other things I've heard. And actually it's because we've just, we've miscommunicated. Okay. Right. So like me reinforcing Jordy's squeals by running out and playing with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which but is why mind, he's at the door. <laughs> but if you don't mind it, then, like then who cares? <laughs> right. But if you're trying, you know, we're, you know, Brady has some issues and we're trying to really communicate to him what we want and what we don't want. So don't reinforce anything that you don't want. So the criteria is down, relaxed hips, no barking. Now, question. First of all, he just offered that without me. Yep, but I'm gonna have you get up and stand over here and, and ask him. Okay, and second question is, um, should I reinforce him? He just did a relaxed down stay for longer than any of our cats right, on right. his own. Right. Do I? You, you know? could. You could certainly reinforce him now because he offered the down. The more he, but not now. Right. But not now. <laughs> the more, he is reinforced for the criteria, which is laying down relaxed and no barking, the more you'll get it. And the rest of the stuff, you just have to let it go. Yeah. And not be afraid that it won't come back because it will. So let's just have you stand up so he gets up again. You'll sort of just help him get in position. It will be interesting to see what he does. Lay down. Good. Give him one Stay. for Stay. And now you do the counting. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Now. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Four, five. Good. Very good. One. Oh, I like the fact you're not looking two, at him. That's very nice too. Three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. Give him one more. And count to three, and then release him with no more treats after that. One, two. Three. And wait. Okay. Good. So have there be a little bit of time between the last treat and you're okay. So okay. this doesn't inadvertently predict a uh -huh. treat. Uh -huh. Okay. Good. So what I'd like you to do is either, you know, you could either send me notes or you could send me little videos if, if anything starts to happen that you're not sure about. But the thing that I really, really, really want you to get into your, into your psyche is criteria, criteria, criteria. Mm -hmm. And the criteria is relaxed. And that's it. And there's, there should be no noise coming out of his mouth, right? And what I was perceiving to have happened is you were getting to the number that you were going to reinforce, 
but he was grumbling mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. And so, nope. So we're just going to wait, kind of erase all those counts and just wait till the grumbling stops. And when you want to get rid of something, you have to wait for it to stop and then have three, at least three seconds of nothing. So he stops one, two, three, and you can treat again. Yep. Okay, good. All right, any other questions? Um, so like I could reinforce him now because he's relaxed mm -hmm. and he's not making any noise. Yep. Yep. Oh boy. So be careful if there's like this, like if he does this and bumps your hand and then lies back down, right. make sure that you've got enough time between all of these shenanigans or you'll chain all of this stuff together. This is what he does. Right, right. Poke you. Oh, maybe you haven't seen me here. I'm going to sneeze at you. Right. And <laughs> see if I can get I'll anything. talk. <laughs> right, right. Good. All right. So it doesn't, um, it's going to happen slowly. You're going to build this down duration up until it's rock solid. Then you will introduce um, pressure in very small amounts so that he can still be successful. And you might need to shift the treats or give higher value treats if the, depending on the level of pressure. So if you start with chicken, then stop using chicken and use something else and then you can go back and chicken will be even better. Um, this was liver treats and other things for him. The end picture that you want is, in my mind, he lays down out there and you're able to walk away from him to a certain distance, open the door and have people come in. So once you get the duration, once you get that duration, then you'll add, like you've already, start, you've already started, gone to a place where you're not looking at him all the time, mm -hmm. right? Then you'll go to a place where you'll take a step away and you'll come back, but only after you have duration. You'll take two steps away and then you're going to come back, treat, treat. Because you went a little further, he stayed, he gets paid a little bit more. It's a little bit bigger behavioral unit. So slowly you'll have to put, you'll have to have that end goal he stays, I walk over here, I open the door, hey, come on in, there's conversation, there's chat, and then you'll, and, and he'll be, yep, I know, I'm just gonna stay here, I'm gonna get paid big time for that. Like That will be up here in value, and the barking and jumping on people pff, won't even exist anymore. Right, right. And in the meantime, he should be leashed, we only did this just to make sure he'd stay here, and you can, so you can crate him, or you can leash him, come here, baby. And I just step on leashes like this so that if I have to, come on in, and he might be, <laughs> but he won't get I've to I've had them. limited success with that technique. <laughs> you have He's to put all, put all your weight up or just grade him. Yeah. But he cannot practice that yep. while you're trying to get this other one going. Sounds good? Yes. And I'm happy with, you know, what we already saw today. Great. All right. So thank you for turning in to this week's episode of Doggy Dilemmas with Brady, the Barker and Jumper, and I look forward to seeing you next week. If you have a doggy dilemma, Denise can help. Visit www.denisemazzola.com for more information. Denise Mazzola is a certified professional dog trainer tested through the Association of Pet Dog Trainers. The association requires recertification every three years with a minimum of 30 hours of continuing education. She has been training dogs and working with families for over 20 years.